Welcome back to the playlist on lipid biosynthesis. Um, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to talk about how we originally synthesize a molecule known as phosphatidate. And you may hear this molecule also referred to in textbooks as phosphatidic acid. And phosphatidic acid is used as the primary building block to go to either triacylglycerols or to other phospholipids. And in fact, uh, phosphatide is a phospholipid itself, although it's not usually found in, in membranes, but it's used to biosynthesize other phospholipids. And we'll look at that in other videos. But in this video, we're just going to look at the biosynthesis of phosphatide. Now, what we're going to do to synthesize phosphatide is we're going to use really everyday molecules that we have floating around the cell to do this. And this is uh, un unlike other processes that we've seen in the past. This is a process that's, that occurs in many different tissues. In fact, it occurs uh, for the most part in all tissues. Okay, When we did amino acid catabolism, we saw that for the most part, um, there were some exceptions, but for the most part, um, that mostly occurred in the liver. But this occurs in all tissues that require fat. Okay, And again, we're going to use everyday molecules that we have floating around the cell. Now, Lipid biosynthesis, especially in the context of triacylglycerols and phospholipids, that's something that's going to occur uh, during times of high energy charge. Well, there's three uh, primary things, that, I think there's three, that, that, that we're going to take into account when we think about high energy charge. Number one, we should have plenty of NADH floating around. I think that's pretty obvious. When we have high energy charge in the cell, that's going to be when we have high NADH. If we come over here to the right before we get into the pathways, we're also going to have high adenosine triphosphate. Okay, So those two things are going to be an absolute requirement um, for doing this process. Okay, And also in this reaction over here that we'll get to in a few minutes, we also have to have ATP. So NADH and ATP are things that we have to have floating around the cell. Okay, And also, um, we'll find that some of these enzymes get upregulated and stimulated when there's high insulin. So a good example of a, of, a, of a situation in which you would be doing a lot of this process would be if you eat a carbohydrate-rich meal, and especially if it's low-fat. Okay, and, and certainly in the standard American diet, uh, certainly you can have meals that are low fat, but they're astronomically loaded with carbohydrates. So doing that is a process uh, that would stimulate lipid biosynthesis, especially in terms of triacylglycerols. Okay, in fact, one of the things that we'll find is that one of the reasons that you tend to gain weight um, whenever you eat a carbohydrate-rich meal constantly is actually because of this process. And what we'll find is that you can actually take substrates out of glycolysis in order to make the lipids. Okay. Now, one of the things I want to be perfectly clear about is in this video, um, we're going to focus on the triacylglycerol slash phospholipid backbone. What do I mean by that? Well, keep in mind that our triacylglycerols and phospholipids, they have these... Um, and, well, let's let's look at a, a triacylglycerol. They have three fatty acyl chains, right? But their backbone is glycerol, right? And you, and you can make a similar argument for phospholipids. They have a phosphate and two a fatty acyl side chains, right? But their backbone is glycerol. So what we're going to focus on in this video is how we get to that glycerol from which we can branch off to other biosyntheses, okay? So again, we're assuming we have high energy charge. We're running glycolysis uh, pretty swiftly, right? So here's our glycolytic process right here. And keep in mind that once we use aldolase and split fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into DHAP and um, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, those could go into um, they could go into uh, the rest of glycolysis, but there's some probability that they might go into this pathway right here. And one of the things that dihydroxyacetone phosphate can do is it can react with glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Okay, And this is going to be an NADH dependent reduction, specifically of this ketone group right here. And so if you reduce a ketone, what functional group do you get?
well, you get an alcohol, right? And that's characteristic of this molecule right here, which is called glycerol 3 phosphate, okay? Now, glycerol 3 phosphate um, has several fates, okay? Either it can react with acyl transferases, as we'll see later on, that can synthesize phosphatidate, or you can actually regenerate dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And so one of the things that um, that glycerol 3 phosphate can do is it can actually go into the mitochondria and it can actually donate its electrons into um, ultimately into the terminal electron acceptor, which is ubiquinone, reducing it to ubiquinol. And we've seen lots of mechanisms that do this so far, but let's actually look at this. So we have glycerol 3 phosphate, and I didn't draw this right here, and I should probably indicate this, but keep in mind that glycerol 3 phosphate right here can actually go into this biosynthesis right here that synthesizes phosphatidate. Okay, so we'll get to that in a few minutes. But one of the things that glycerol 3 phosphate does is it allows the regeneration of NAD. Well, why does it do that? Well, if you have dihydroxyacetone phosphate and you're using NADH reducing equivalents to reduce it to glycerol 3 phosphate, you end up regenerating this guy, which is NAD. And then that can be used in subsequent glycolytic reactions. Okay, so it plays a large role in regenerating NAD. But at the same time, the glycerol 3 phosphate can actually go through the mitochondrial membrane and enter into an enzyme that's in the inner mitochondrial membrane, right? And it's called uh, mitochondrial glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. So, this right here, this enzyme, this would be the cytosolic form. Okay, so we have a cytosolic glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, but we also have an inner mitochondrial one. Okay, and ultimately what's going to happen is the initial electron acceptor for glycerol 3 phosphate is going to be FAD, and we see the FAD that's shown right here. Okay, and that's of course going to reduce it to FADH2. Okay, and in the process we generate dihydroxyacetone phosphate which can then go back out into the cytosol, right, which is out here. This is the cytosol out here. And the dihydroxyacetone phosphate can either do another cycle of this, right, or it can go back into glycolysis towards pyruvate. And again, these are really just probability functions, right? The probability that it'll react with either enzyme is really dependent on the concentration of the enzymes themselves, okay? But what ends up happening is when you have insulin present, that's going to stimulate this enzyme right here, which is glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase in the cytosol. Okay. Now, one thing before we go into the biosynthesis of phosphatidate, I just want to mention this that we generated FADH2 through inner mitochondrial glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. But the, that FADH2 will then donate its electrons to ubiquinone, reducing it to ubiquinol. And that's what we see right here. This guy right here is ubiquinol. And we know that that will send its electrons into complex three of the mitochondria. Uh, respiratory chain, also referred to as cytochrome C ubiquinol oxidoreductase, and it ends up pumping four protons into the inner membrane space, which ends up powering ATP synthase. Okay, so that's sort of a cycle that sort of occurs on the side of glycolysis. But keep in mind that insulin is going to stimulate this enzyme right here, glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase in the cytosol. So we end up with glycerol 3 phosphate, but one of the things we also have to bear in mind is that uh, glycerol 3 phosphate. Um, can react with a series of acyl transferases, okay? Now, the acyl transferases right here, I really should have put that there's two types. Number one, we have a, a, what I'll call a type A and a type B, okay? And the type A acyl transferases are just called glycerol 3-phosphate acyl transferases. So it's glycerol 3-phosphate acyl transferases, okay? And what they're going to do is they're going to take a fatty acyl CoA, so this R prime group right here, that's just a fatty acyl group, okay? And it's going to transfer that group ultimately onto the first position of the glycerol 3 phosphate. So that's the first position. This is the second position, and this is the third position. So ultimately, what you can think of is, and let me do this in a different color, red, 
this hydrogen right here is ultimately going to get replaced with this group right here okay in other words this group right here is going to replace the hydrogen okay so i didn't show the structure here but that's what happens you end up forming an ester linkage between the glycerol 3 phosphate and the fatty acid okay and that's catalyzed by this enzyme, which is called glycerol 3-phosphate acetyl transferase, okay? And make sure you distinguish it between acetyl transferase, okay? An acetyl group is basically just this right here. That's an acetyl group. But when you have an acyl group, okay, they're usually these really, really long fatty acyl chains and so forth. Okay, so there's a huge difference between acetyl groups and acyl groups. Just, just make sure you bear that in mind. Okay, and what glycerol 3 phosphate acyl transferase is going to do is it's going to transfer that fatty acyl group onto position one. Okay, and that's going to give you um, a one acyl glycerol 3 phosphate. Okay, now there's a second type of acyl transferase, which we called B right here. And that is what we refer to as 1-acyl glycerol 3-phosphate acyl transferase, okay? So it's a different acyl transferase, okay? And what that's going to do is basically the same reaction except for the fact, and I'll do this in purple, except for the fact that it's going to transfer this acyl group specifically onto the second position. So that hydrogen that's on the position 2 hydroxyl group is going to get replaced with the fatty acyl chain of the coenzyme A fatty acid, okay? And of course, in the process of both of these acyl transferases, you end up generating coenzyme A. Now, there's two things I want to talk about briefly, um, and that's number one, the source of these fatty acyl CoA's, okay? We've actually already seen the source of them before when we did beta oxidation, okay? Recall that before we did beta oxidation, we had to activate the fatty acid. Okay, so we took this fatty acid right here and used adenosine triphosphate and coenzyme A and ligated it to coenzyme A using fatty acyl CoA synthetase. And that's this guy right here, fatty acyl CoA synthetase. Okay, and that's actually how we get um, these fatty acids right here. And I could have drawn another one for this guy also. Okay, so that reaction occurs in the cytosol. Okay, that, remember that fatty acyl CoA synthetase is in the cytosol. But the other point that I want to make is that these acyl transferases, for the most part, are microsomal. And the, um, the original acyl transferase can also occur um, in, the, in the mitochondria. But really, for the purposes of an exam, you can really think of them both occurring in the, in the microsomes, which is basically the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? And so they occur there. And after you do a series of these two acyl transferase reactions, what you end up generating is this guy, which is called phosphatidate. Okay? And notice on phosphatidate, and this, by the way, should have an, a second prime, both of these... Um, these fatty acyl groups are now esterified to the glycerol backbone, or I should say the glycerol 3-phosphate backbone, right? And the phosphatidate now can be used in phospholipid biosynthesis, and it can also be used in triacyl glycerol biosynthesis, okay? And in another video, we'll actually look at those reactions. Now, one thing I want to mention very briefly about phosphatidate is that it's kept really low inside cells because the, th this molecule... Can be, is quickly consumed to go to phospholipid biosynthesis, but it's also quickly consumed to go to triacyl glycerol biosynthesis. Okay, so it's not very high in cells. And another reason that it's not very high in cells is because it can also act as a detergent. Keep in mind that these are prime groups and this are double prime groups, okay? Those are just long carbon chains, right? They're long carbon chains. So those are hydrophobic. And also bear in mind that this guy right here, this phosphate, okay, is hydrophilic, right? Very hydrophilic. And so it can act as a detergent and, and do all sorts of nasty things to cells. So th for that reason, and also because you're siphoning it off to form this and this, okay, um, it's kept rather low in cells, okay? And you, for the most part, won't find it in membranes, okay? Other derivatives of phosphatidate will actually be found there instead, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Now, there's one other method that we can use to synthesize glycerol 3-phosphate, and that's actually just from glycerol, okay? Glycerol kinase 
can transfer the gamma phosphate of ATP onto glycerol to make glycerol 3 phosphate. Okay, so if we have free glycerol floating around that's left over from, say, something like, um, you know, it's left over from something like, um, you know, a lipase action, right? We can actually use that to actually remake the triacylglycerol or the phospholipid, okay? And that committed step is catalyzed by glycerol kinase, okay? And again, that particular reaction would be stimulated by insulin, okay? So one of the controls of actually going into the lipid biosynthesis, okay, is actually controlled by insulin, okay? So if you eat a carbohydrate-rich meal, um, and especially if it's low in fat, um, you're actually going to stimulate this process. Now, lipids really don't have any effect on insulin, but certainly carbohydrates do. So if you eat a carbohydrate-rich meal and you spike insulin, right, this insulin is going to get released by the pancreas, and you're going to stimulate this process when insulin binds to its receptor tyrosine kinase. You'll get all this stuff happening, okay? So... I hope this video makes sense. Let's do a very quick recap, okay? So let's actually focus on the lipid biosynthesis component. So we can actually siphon off dihydroxyacetone phosphate from glycolysis and react it with cytosolic glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, which, which is, of course, named for the reverse reaction. We have to end up burning an NADH, but remember, we're assuming that we're in high energy charge, and so we have plenty of NADH floating around, and that's going to regenerate NAD, which can be used in subsequent glycolytic or TCA cycle reactions, and then we get glycerol 3-phosphate. The glycerol 3-phosphate can also be formed from glycerol kinase, um, using the gamma phosphate of ATP, assuming we have free glycerol floating around, okay? And then the glycerol 3-phosphate can react with, number one, glycerol phosphate acyl transferase to give us glycerol, or excuse me, to give us acyl glycerol phosphate. And then we can react that with one acyl glycerol 3-phosphate acyl transferase to give us this guy down here, which is phosphatidic acid or um correctly at physio physiological pH, phosphatidate, okay? And then that can be used in phospholipid and triacylglycerol synthesis, which we'll actually see in other videos. And just bear in mind, this process is stimulated by insulin, and that's how the cell knows when to do this. You eat a carbohydrate-rich meal, and you end up synthesizing the backbone for all of these molecules right here, phospholipids and triacylglycerols, okay? And keep in mind, this biosynthesis is just for the backbone, okay? In another video, we'll actually look at the biosynthesis of the um, fatty acid chains, and that reaction is actually catalyzed by an enzyme called fatty acid synthase, which is a multi-enzyme complex that synthesizes um, the fatty acids two carbons at a time from malonyl-CoA. And we've already seen a video on malonyl-CoA synthesis, okay? So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on phosphatidate synthesis. See you in the next video.